By the way, what you do here is bigger than what happens in this room. Do you know that? Okay. We are a part of uh, investing and supporting and praying and equipping people throughout the world, and the Johnsons are part of that. And so make sure that you say hello to them, and they're in the back. Uh, if you want to get on their mailing list or whatever to help support them, please talk to them about that as well. Okay, well, for a long time now, I think we're in uh, part 11, we have been journeying with Abram and Sarai, whose names have been turned to Abraham and Sarah. We've been seeing their journey of faith in the book of Genesis, starting with this strange call of this God to this couple far away from the land that was promised to them. The call was, and the promise, would, would you follow me to a place in which I will show you? And there's a blessing with that promise that God himself would make from this couple, make them a blessing, and that all of the nations would be blessed through them. God gave them a series of promises. And we see in Genesis chapter 10, they took God for his word and journeyed forward into a land they had not yet known. And we have traced them and seen how they've interacted with these promises. Sometimes they were courageous and they were brave and they were strong and they stepped in. At other times there was doubts and there was missteps and there was misunderstandings. And God throughout their life continued to convey and expand and tell them about his promises to them, saying that nothing is impossible for them. Now, in, for, for God, that is. Part of his promises, God's promise to them, was for a, mm, a family, a son, a seed in which all of the nations of the world would be blessed. Now, this was <laughs> difficult for them to grasp because this couple was advanced in years. When they had the first call, they were 75 years old, Abraham was. And then when the promise was fulfilled, Abraham was 100 years old, and his wife was around 90 years old. She was not able to have children, but God miraculously, who enjoys bringing life from death, promised them, and his promise came fulfilled. So this morning we're turning to Genesis chapter 21. So if you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. The verses that we're looking at are going to be on the screen. We're just going to look at a few of them this morning. And and, have you remember that this couple was being prepared for this child to be arrived. And again, they made a misstep and God redeemed them as they relapsed into an old way of thinking. And now the moment has arrived, the moment that they've been waiting for, for 20 five years. And we're going to learn from our passage today what is true or what is true about God, and then coupling with that, what we are to do. And so we're going to look at three aspects from this passage that I hope will be in your mind, impact your heart, and then be lived out through your life as we are looking to build our faith, as we are looking to gain greater hope, as we are looking to be strengthened, as we ourselves wait upon some of the promises God has given to us as individuals, but to us as uh, his body, the church, as in he's coming again, he's going to make all things new. And so we look forward to that as we continue to walk in faith. So here we are in Genesis chapter 21, and this is the first thing I want you to know. Number one, know God is gracious, that God is trustworthy, and that God is on time. On time. So here we are, Genesis chapter 21, starting with verse 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. And he, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time 
God had promised him. First we see now that the Lord was gracious to Sarah. Now there is a difference between grace and mercy, by the way. I just talked to the youth about this on Thursday night, just briefly when the, us guys were meeting. Mercy, by the way, is not receiving what you deserve. That's mercy. For example, if I'm out here on State Street and I am exceeding the speed limit and I'm pulled over by one of our local peace officers and they hand me a ticket which I deserve because I broke the law and if I decide I'm going to go in front of the judge and I plead my case for whatever reason and the judge decides to let me off with a warning, he is extending mercy not giving me what I deserve. And God is merciful for sure, because in Christ, Christ took on the the trespass or paid the payment of my sin. And so God extends mercy to us that way. Now, coupled with God not just giving us what we deserve as far as the punishment for our trespass, God is gracious to us. Aren't you grateful for God's grace? And what grace means is God gives to us what we don't deserve. So mercy not getting what we do deserve in a negative way. Grace extends to us that we're getting what we don't deserve, which ultimately is fulfilled in eternal life and in heaven and in the glories that God would have for us, his spirit into us. He could have just forgiven us of our sins and left it at that. But God is not only rich in mercy, he is abundant in grace. James, the half-brother of Jesus, recorded these words in chapter 1, verse 17 of his book, and said this, Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. That tells us, that anything that we have from that, uh, that is good is from God. Have you experienced anything good in your life? The answer to that, of course. Right? You got up today, right? That's good. You understand a language. You have the words of God in your heart language. That is good. God has given us spouses and children and grandchildren and so many things. So whatever is good and perfect is because of God's grace for us, our good Father who created all things. We know, and hopefully you know, that it is by grace that we have been saved. Through faith. And this isn't our own doing. It is the gift or the grace of God. Not a result of work so that no person can boast. When we get to heaven, God's not going to enter us in because we're such a great person. Okay? You and I cannot earn grace. Grace is given in reflection of the one who gives it to us. We will never be good enough to get into heaven. There's only one who was good enough. His name is Jesus, right? Perfect, holy, full of love, full of grace. And God, through Christ, granted us this grace to be redeemed, restored, renewed, giving us his spirit as deposit of what is to come making us children of Abraham. The Lord was gracious to Sarah, and the Lord is gracious to us. And part of my prayers for us as a congregation, that our eyes would be more open to God's grace to us. His mercies are new, how often? Every morning, great is his faithfulness. And often I find myself in dark places when I am not seeing God's grace to me. So it's a good prayer for each one of us, and my prayer for for you as individuals and us as a congregation, that God would open our heart, would open our minds, 
to understand, to comprehend his glory seen in his goodness given to us in his grace. That's a good thing. Please pray that along with me when you get up in the morning. God, make me more aware of your grace to me today. God, help me to see the good things of my life. It takes no faith to see the difficult things and the hardships, right? Everyone sees those. But we ask, God, in the midst of whatever I am facing, and all of us in this room are facing multiple things and challenges, in those challenges, we ask for the grace to see God's goodness. And I want to encourage you to ask God for that sight. The Lord was gracious to Sarah, telling us that his grace is extended also to us. God is trustworthy. He will do what he promises to do. Amen, Pastor, right? Thank you. This is an interactive experience, okay? He is trustworthy. So when Jesus proclaimed that he will come back again, he will come back again. When he says, I will give you my Holy Spirit to live in you, to be upon you, to guide you. He meant it and kept his promise. When we die, the only hope we have for resurrection and new life is the promise of Christ. God cannot lie. Do you like that characteristic of God? When he he says something, he means it, and he says exactly what he means to say. So when you read your Bibles, and I hope you are reading your Bibles, I'm expecting you to read your Bible. I want you to pay special attention to some of and the promises that you see in the Word and highlight them or underline them or circle them or write them down somewhere to remind yourself of this God who fulfills his promises. It's important for us to understand these things and recognize us that his promises are yes and amen. I'm assured of what happens after death, not because I've been there, but because there's a person who has been there and tells us about it. I'm assured of these things, not because of my goodness, which is like filthy rags to God, but because of Christ's goodness. These help us provide hope and strength and illumination and encouragement. God is trustworthy, and the Lord did for Sarah what he, God, had promised. That helps us to know God's resume, his track record, that 100% he has fulfilled his promises in the past, meaning that he will do so in the future. And I also like in this passage that at the very time God had promised him, which tells us God is on time. Have you ever thought that God was a little tardy in answering your prayer? What's taking you so long? Got to think about it. We have to understand that, number one, of course God is gracious. Number two, of course God is trustworthy. And number three, he's on time. But we have to understand how God understands time. A thousand years is like a day. And a day is like a thousand years. And Peter, the apostle, who was a close friend with Christ, was reflecting from where? From prison, right? About God's 
faithfulness. And people were wondering and expecting, well, shouldn't he come back right now? It's pretty bad. And Peter said, God is not slow in fulfilling his promises as some su- suppose. That God wants to get sufficient, give sufficient time for all people to hear the message of the gospel. That's why it is imperative that missionaries and disciples and people spread this message to the ends of the earth to fulfill God's graciousness to everyone. And so if God is, in our mind, delaying, remember that God does what God intends to do when he intends to do it. And trust his wisdom. There are things that I've been praying for for 30 years. Some of you have been praying for some things 50 years or 60 years. God, where are you? Why are you delaying? And we'll see this in some of the Psalms as well. As David and others are waiting for God, trusting in God. We have to trust his wisdom that there are reasons in which he delays. So in the darkness, will you believe that there will be a new dawn coming? Will you believe that God in his timing will make all things new? Part of the journey of faith is waiting in the waiting room. In it, God gives us companions. In it, God gives us his promises. In it, God encourages us and helps us. But continue to trust, to hold on, to continue in faith, knowing that he is on time. Continue to wait. And to trust in him, knowing that you and I are never alone. I will be with you how long? Always, right, Jesus said? Even to the end of the age, to all generations. Before you were here, he was here. And after we are gone, he'll still be here. Working, moving, instructing, drawing transforming people's life. So from this passage, we see God's graciousness to Sarah. Also, he's gracious to us. We see that he does exactly what he promises, that he's trustworthy to them, and he's trustworthy to us also. At the very time God promised to happen, it happened to them. This was a moment of celebration. This was a moment of anticipation. This was a a pregnant pause, so to speak, for 25 years as God prepared their hearts, God renewed their faith, and God fulfilled his promise to them. Now, Abraham and Sarah, God made a covenant with them and asked them to do some things, and this is the second thing for us. Walk in covenant, and that word is specific, in relationship with God. So knowing that he is trustworthy, knowing that he is gracious, knowing that he's on time, knowing that he extends promises to us, knowing that he invites us to be in relationship with him, knowing these things, we have opportunity and responsibility to walk according to our relationship with him. Verse 3, 4, and 5. Abram Abraham, after this child was born, gave the name Isaac, which means laughter, by the way. The name which God intended him to give to the son. Abraham followed through with that. Called him Isaac. To the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now, if you remember, if you've been following in this series, we saw this covenant that God extended to Abraham, saying, because we are in relationship, 
and I am being gracious to you and walking with you. This is a line of demarcation. This is a symbol saying that you've received God's promises. And we know now that, that this was a changing of the heart. At that time, it was an external change that took place. But it was symbolic in the ways that God, these were the covenant people of God. And so Abraham followed through with his relationship and commitment to God. God invited him to receive his promises and then commanded him to walk in faithfulness to those promises. And Abraham did so named this child Isaac as he was commanded, circumcised this child on the eighth day as God commanded him, which is theologically significant. And we are also told that Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. This is a privilege that we have to walk with God according to his word. That's why it's important for us to understand, to comprehend, to meditate, to build upon, to put into our hearts his word for us and recognize that we have a great, again, responsibility and privilege of walking with him. So we know that God is gracious. Knowing about him is important and trustworthy and on time. Now we have opportunity to walk in covenant with him. And I'm not sure what that looks like for you, but I know it's going to be according to his word. (laughs) Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And loving our neighbor as our self. And having an opportunity to make disciples of all nations. Blessing to the neighborhood and blessing to the nation. We have opportunity to walk in covenant community with him and partner with what God is doing here in Rockford and to the rest of the world. Thirdly, and this is the focus that I want us to get from this passage, we are to marvel in the miracle of new life. Now, can you imagine being this couple Imagine not having being able to conceive children and having this God tell you that this was going to take place in the old age. This was a miraculous, impossible by human standard promise. And yet God, rich in mercy, said this will indeed happen. Verse 6 of Genesis chapter 21. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. This child, Isaac, meaning laughter. God has done this. And everyone who hears about this, they'll laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have bore him a son in his old age. There was a marvel at this miracle. Sarah recognized it because she knew she was unable to conceive. And now being 90 years old, and now her husband at 100, because of God's graciousness to them, bringing from death to life, there was a marvel of this. There was a laughter of this. This is one of the reasons why we share our stories. And thank you, Jennifer, for sharing last week. Beautiful and powerful. One story of redemption, and there are stories of redemption here in this room all over the place. God's miracle work taking us from following a pathway of darkness away from God's good grace to us, and God taking us from darkness to life because of his grace, from death to life because of his mercy. 
We should marvel at these and we share our story because others can marvel at as well. Marvel at what God has done. So it is important for us to share our stories of faith. Amen, Pastor. <laughs> share it. The salvation stories, of course, but also God's goodness to you in your life. How he intervened when there was financial issues, how he repaired when there was health issues, how he brought those who were in um, conflict back together in community. Lots of stories. And we say, glory to God, because only God can change hearts and minds. Only God, who is rich in mercy, can make us alive with Christ. This is why Ephesians chapter 4 says this. Because, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Why? Because of his love. How? Through his mercy. What did he do? Made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, pointing to this couple, saying them as an illustration. God does that as well with us. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages, God might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God delights in his grace. God delights in his goodness. And we are recipients of these things. I want us all to get the gospel, but I want us never to get over it. I want you to get it. If I asked you why God would allow you in eternity to be in heaven, I don't want your response to be, well, because I'm a fairly decent person. That's the wrong answer. I hope you're a decent person. I hope you're a godly person. But you and I are not perfect people. Right? The wages of sin is death. You know that verse. What we've earned, because God is just and he's loving his death. So when I ask you, why is it that God makes you a son or daughter, adopts you into his family? The answer is not because I'm a good person. The answer is because Christ, Christ is the perfect person. I put my faith in him and his grace and God's mercy. That's the answer. Belief in Christ, the perfect one. And being found in him, God even takes from us, giving us new life through his promises and his goodness. So I want us to get the gospel, but I never want us to get over it. God restored in me the joy of my salvation. You know who said that? David. At a time that was very difficult to him. And if you're having a hard time finding joy in your life, you can be grateful that you're saved, bro. Right? And God, help me to understand that even though I'm going through something, it's only for a lifetime. I'm glad you laughed. <laughs> Our life compared to eternity, no comparison. I've been suffering this for 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. But it won't be forever. God views our life through the lens of eternity. 
I want to encourage you to view, view your life through the lens of eternity. It'll give you different perspective. When we say God is late, God said, what are you talking about, son? You were just born just 80 years ago. I've been here for a long time. This helps. This helps. Will God heal everyone? The answer is yes. I just don't know when he will. I know what will happen on the other side, guaranteed. Trust him. Marvel in the miracle of new life. I look at my own story, and often I'll say, it's scandalous that God reached to me. Scandalous. God, rich in mercy, full of grace, reaches to us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You and I once were lost, but now we're found. We were blind, but now, God, by his grace, we can see. So this morning, we're going to marvel anew at this as we have three people who are getting baptized today. And then we will be renewing our covenant, those who are believers, with God through communion. So just a word about baptism. Why water? Why baptism? What's this about? Okay. Quickly, <laughs> through the Old Testament, often water is seen as a symbol from going from death to life. We'll see this first. God created the heavens and new earth, separating the waters. We know about that. And then we'll see through water, God saved this man named Noah. Do you remember him and his family? Through water from what was dead to new life. We see God using water in various times in the Old Testament. Where we'll see Moses being passed by water from death to as in a death sentence to life. We see the people of God in the Old Testament. When we know about Abraham, if we continue the story, that they go into Egypt as slaves, and they grow at the right time. They, they become a large group of people, and God delivers them through the Red Sea. You remember that? Passing from slavery into a new thing. And then God again, in a line of demarcation, separates the Jordan River into the new thing that he has for them, passing through water. We see this in multiple places with Naaman in the Old Testament and Jonah in the Old Testament. And then we turn the pages of the New Testament after 400 years of the word of the Lord being silent. There is a man on the scene. His name is John the Baptist. right, Preparing the way of the Lord and calling people to repentance and a new way of life. And he baptized them in the Jordan River. We see Christ himself being baptized. Not that he needed forgiveness of sin, but it was a line of demarcation of fulfilling all righteousness. And he went from his growing up years and after that moment, he went into his ministry years. There was a line that came through baptism. Now, baptism, it was heard, uh, Margie talked about this, that it is a sign of a, an external sign of an internal change. Baptism doesn't save anybody. Okay? Faith in Christ saves all who believe in him. But what baptism is, is saying that I have decided to follow Jesus. And it's a symbolic moment in which the one being baptized is dead in Christ or in Christ and made alive in him. It's an external sign of an internal vow. Just like this ring I wear, okay? This ring, okay, is a symbol of a vow I made 
to a young lady named Gretchen. And I promised her to be faithful to her for better or for worse through sickness or health. I promised and made an internal vow. And this ring, well, it wasn't this ring because I broke my original <laughs> ring. This ring symbolizes that, that vow. And so when I have this on my finger, it reminds me of a vow that I made to this young lady. And it tells other people, this dude is taken, right? Shield. It's funny, but it's not that funny. Okay. <laughs> it helps, right? And so it's an external sign of an internal commitment. Baptism, in some ways, are like that. It's an external sign to everyone saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. And it's a beautiful, powerful moment. And we'll see in the uh, New Testament, as you go through, read the book of Acts, that the believers, the people believed and were baptized. They believed and they were baptized. They were believed and they were baptized. Often it's a uh, demarcation of death to life, of course. And then uh, sometimes it's a... Um, coronation as to what is going to happen coming next, a new start. And so I'm excited today, and we have three, and I've asked them to share a bit of their story. And so we're going to have, if Alfred could come on up, and Eric's going to help Alfred. Alfred is blind, by the way, and we have a privilege of baptizing him. And Eric's going to help us. So, Alfred, this is a good day. Thank you for saying yes, yes to sharing a part of your story. So, why don't we welcome Alfred? Probably a couple hundred people here. So, if you could share us uh, a bit of your story, here's the microphone right here. Thank All right. You guys, thank you, guys. This is a wonderful day for me today. And I'll tell you a little about my testimony. I come from Chicago, Illinois, the worst side of um, the west side of Chicago, Illinois. And when I was growing up, I got into street gangs. Then I used these drugs for over 20 years. I carried guns on me, been in prison several times, you know, and I just got tired of being tired, you know, and I begged God to change me, but I wasn't ready until 2016 when I lost my eyesight. So I begged him and begged him to come into my life and he did, and I love him for that because I don't have to do the things that I used to do, and it hurts me to my heart. And my parents is up there in heaven, they looking down at me, they didn't raise me like this, you know? And today, I walk by faith, not by sight. I don't have to do those things. Thank you all. Thank you all for that, it was wonderful, thank you. Okay, he's gonna bring you up to the tank. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll see you up there, okay? Okay. There's more to that story, and I encourage you to talk to Alfred. So he's going to go up, and they're going to get ready. We'll meet him in the tank. Angela is next. Where are you? There she is. I have decided. She's already crying, which is okay. I, I cry too. <laughs> All right, go ahead and share with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Angela. Um, Let's see here. Well, I was born in Chicago, too, and um, I was always going to different churches growing up. Um, they always talk about God. And um, so I, when I was little, I always believed in God. And um, as I got older, as a teenager, I started losing my faith in God because uh, I would hear questions like, um, if God is real, who wrote the Bible? Can you bring it up? I'm sorry. Okay, no, you're good. <laughs> And then, so I lost my faith, and um, I started drinking a lot when I was in my 20s. Um, and uh, eventually I started having seizures at 21, and uh, that changed my life because uh, it's like a, uh, a beautiful disaster because uh, my epilepsy, I, when it first started, um, I used to have them when I was sleeping. So uh, it was always great to wake up in the morning. Um, so... It just made me realize that uh, life is precious and the people around you are precious. So you shouldn't be holding grudge or anything like that because anyone could pass away and then you could just lose that moment you could have been with them instead of holding that grudge. Um, 
So I started uh, drinking um, heavily once I turned 21, and then um, uh, I was just battling alcoholism for many years, and I still am. Um, so this to me is not like how my life started, it's how I'm going to finish it. So me getting baptized. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's good. I started believing in uh, God and Jesus again um, in November. So, like, all of this is so new to me, and um, I didn't have friends. I lost in touch with everyone because I didn't feel worthy to have friendship or be loved by my family because I felt like I ruined the relationship with them by drinking too much and blacking out and acting crazy. So, um, uh, I w once uh, I had a backpack trip, and um, I was gone for uh, almost like a month and a half in Hawaii, and the first farm that I was at, the, the farmer was a very heavy religious Christian person, and um, I didn't believe in God then, so he would try to talk to me and pray with me and stuff. I didn't want to accept it, um, but eventually I left his farm, and I was on YouTube, and I seen a video that said, um, is this really Jesus' grave? And I got curious, so I clicked on the video, and um, it was on a history channel, and then um, I watched it, and ever since then, I started believing in Jesus because uh, growing up, uh, once I started losing my faith, I didn't feel like Jesus was a real person, but now I know he is real, and God is real, and um, that's why now um, I want to get baptized for I could start my 30s, a whole new chapter, and um, be a better person for my family and everyone else. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Good job. Good job. Okay, we'll just meet you over there. Okay. Last but not, not least, Jackson's going to come up here and share a part of his story. Thanks so much, Angela. Appreciate what you shared with us. And he is ready to go, shorts and all, which is amazing. <laughs> this is Jackson. Thanks, man. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Jackson, of course. Um, we're all responsible for our own choices, right? No matter what our situation is or what life throws at us, I lost my best friend at a very young age. It was a very dramatic time for me. And I chose to walk in sin and live a very individualistic life and a life led by pleasure. Drugs, alcohol, sexual immorality, the whole works. And it took me a while to work through it, uh, even after I got over the pain of losing my best friend. A lot of my bad habits stuck around and followed me for years after. Um, it wasn't until about five months ago that this veil that I was living under, gone. God showed me all of the sins I had done. He showed me that the life that I was living was going to lead me nowhere that I wanted it to go. I had all these plans. I had this beautiful idea of where I wanted to end up, and what I was doing was not going to get me there. And this led me to a, a period that I'm still kind of in of you know, a lot of anxiety, a lot of panic attacks, a lot of wow, what have I been doing for years? And um, through that, I have leaned on God. I have fallen into his arms. Um, he blessed me with this church, with you guys, with meeting Dave, uh, finding a lot of great new people, a lot of friends and support group. And um, because of his love and his grace, um, I've decided to commit my life to him and walk with him. Good job, buddy. Okay, we'll go over there. Okay, we're getting ready for baptism, so there'll be some music, and then we'll be, we'll be, up, <laughs> be up there in the tank. And I, I told these guys, in order to be baptized here, you have to get over your fear of public speaking, your fear of water, your fear of being electrocuted, and your fear of heights. <laughs> so it's happening right here. So we'll see you in just a moment.
good day. Yes. What a beautiful day. Indeed. It's a powerful day. Why don't you come on, on a little bit here so I don't hit your head on the edge? <laughs> That'd be bad. Okay. Wow. Is it? Yes, it is. Okay. So, Jackson, because of your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your commitment to follow Him, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. 